Greetings, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to a discussion about the Lenape people. Uh, this is being presented by the Indigenous Peoples Day Philly, um, an organization uh, that has been around for about four years now. And uh, the organization is uh, meant to uh, promote uh, and uh, bring together the original people of the greater Philadelphia area, uh, which is the original homeland of the Lenape people. Today's uh, Philadelphia is made up of a, a large cross section of native people and activists and artists and ID, um, IDP, IPD Philly um, is a, uh, a, a very active and dynamic organization. And this panel discussion is uh, part of the uh, online recognition uh, of uh, Indigenous Peoples Day in Philadelphia. Uh, and since because of the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus pandemic, we're meeting online. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I want to uh, introduce myself. My name is Curtis Zuniga. I am an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. We are headquartered in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Delaware is our um, uh, modern contemporary name uh, that, that came upon us during the, the colonial days. Uh, but we are Lenape. At heart, we are Lenape people. Um, and I am a, 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 not only an enrolled uh, member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians, but I am also the cultural director for the Delaware tribe. And again, our headquarters is in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Um, I am uh, pleased to uh, uh, welcome uh, three other individuals who, who I will be um, introducing one by one when their time comes to talk about uh, diaspora or the movement of the Lenape people from the original homeland to the uh, to the communities and the geographic locations that they occupy today. Uh, so if I may uh, begin as your uh, host and moderator, um, I'm going to talk about Lenape Hoking, the original homeland of the Lenape people. Um, and if we could take a look at that first slide. Um, the original homeland of the Lenape people um, ex uh, in the geographic region extends from uh, approximately the foothills of the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York. If you get any further north of that, then you're getting up into Iroquois country. But uh, probably, you know, if you follow the what now the what uh, what's now known as the Hudson River, but you know, from those foothills of the Catskill Mountains down into what a company, what a comp, uh, companies, all of uh, uh, the New York, Manhattan area, um, all of New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, including uh, Philadelphia, and then down into <clears throat> uh, along what's now known as the Delaware River, uh, all the way down to about the northernmost part of what's today the state of Delaware around the Wilmington or so. All of that area that's shaded is the uh, original Lenape Hokie. Uh, and after, you know, we had a very rich and vibrant uh, homeland and made up of many different villages. And in this slide, you'll see when we talk about different dialects, these are language dialects. And just like any geographic area, you're going to have a, a, some uh, differences in how the language is spoken um, and uh, some of the words are a little bit different based on the geographic location and um, uh, the various villages that made up Lenape Hoking had their own unique identity and character but so many of them were closely tied to a common language base and an Algonquin based language Eastern Woodlands people that uh, had a certain lifestyle and a certain ceremonial 
and cultural context that was the common thread of the Lenape people. Now, uh, Europeans, when they first started showing up, uh, we encountered the Dutch. Uh, then after that, we encountered the uh, British, English, and finally, uh, the American colonizers all encountered the Lenape people. And after what were ostensibly or seemingly uh, well-meaning agreements for shared occupancy of Lenape land, uh, eventually our people were, um, we were killed off. Uh, there was just outright genocide, land theft, um, uh, uh, terrible uh, depredations upon the Lenape people, which caused us to be cast out of the lands that were our homelands for time immemorial. And all of this began approximately the mid 17th century. And uh, as we each tell our respective stories, um, you know, I can make reference to the Lenape in um, 1682 and entering into an agreement uh, with William Penn, who showed up and with a piece of paper and said, I have a charter for a uh, Pennsylvania colony here. And the king gave me this charter. So this is our land. Uh, that's not a good way to start a relationship. Nonetheless, uh, great leaders like the affable one, Taminen, uh, did enter into a friendly agreement to provide um, shared occupancy of Lenape land. And the beginning of the Pennsylvania colony uh, headquartered in what's now uh, the city of Philadelphia. So for those people with uh, IPD Philly that are watching this, you know what your homeland is. You may not know about the Lenape origins. And I, I would encourage you to follow along with this conversation because those origins of where we were have led to us now over 250 years later being in our respective geographic locations in the United States and Canada. Now, my band of Lenape, uh, later known as Delaware Tribe, um, and if we can go to the second slide, we, uh, over a period of time, were pushed out of New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and it wasn't friendly at all. Uh, promises were made in treaties and um, and uh, other type, types of agreement. Uh, many times they were based on commerce, not just shared occupancy, but it was for commerce uh, to improve our lives. But those promises never manifested themselves in the way that we thought they would. Now, the Delaware tribe was pushed out of, uh, let's say, the Philadelphia area and pushed into uh, what's now uh, the state of Ohio, the Ohio Territory. And um, we traveled along with other uh, tribes that were going through similar um, uh, circumstances, particularly for my tribe, the Shawnee. The Shawnee people went through the same thing. Uh, they came out of Ohio and Kentucky, and we lived amongst each other. Uh, the Lenape were very uh, important part of the United States history with the uh, Revolutionary War, uh, being the first tribe to sign a treaty with the United States of America on September 17, 1778. So um, we helped the American army uh, ultimately defeat the British, and uh, the 13 colonies became the United States of America, uh, there was even a promise of a 14th state in the United States, an all-Indian state, and the Delawares were promised to be at the head of that state. Unfortunately for us, that was never approved or manifested by the federal government, and um, we were pushed further out of uh, Ohio, uh, and our diaspora, our movement, took us across Ohio into Indiana, in the early uh, 
18th century, or I'm sorry, the early 19th century, you know, a period of about 1790 through uh, 1820 or so. Uh, we were in Ohio and, and then pushed into Indiana. Uh, there was a uh, Delaware village uh, along the White River in uh, northeastern Indiana. Uh, and there are there's a town called Muncie, Indiana. Um, uh, but the Delawares continued to be moved out of lands that the that the United States, the white people, wanted. And they enforced it with their uh, armies and continued to push my band of Delawares uh, further westward uh, in across the Mississippi River during the time of Andrew Jackson and the uh, Indian Removal Act. Uh, we came into what's now the state of Missouri. We had a couple of reservations there during the 1820s, we were not particularly uh, pleased with the lands that we occupied. Um, and then uh, in around 1820, uh, we were um, in, if you look at this map, you'll see an outline of what's now the state of Missouri in southwestern Missouri. We had a reservation there. But again, uh, we had to be pushed out of there into the, what's now the state of Kansas. As you look at that uh, little outline of the Delaware Reservation in southwestern Missouri uh, in the years of, of uh, uh, 18, uh, 1819, 1820, uh, I'm, I'm amusing, I'm amusing, uh, amusingly uh, reflecting on that because that little box right there now, that's where Springfield and Branson, Missouri are. And golly, if we had stayed there, and that was still our reservation today. Uh, I, I could have had my own dinner theater and been performing, you know, three nights a week at my own dinner theater at Branson. But obviously that didn't happen either. Um, in the 1830s, we were moved to uh, uh, the state of Kansas. We had a reservation there in a corridor between Lawrence, Kansas, now the site of uh, both uh, the University of Kansas and Haskell Indian Nations University. Um, and Leavenworth, Kansas, the infamous uh, Fort Leavenworth and the prison there. Uh, up through the Civil War in the mid-1860s, uh, we had that reservation. It was rich farmland. We were a, a, a still a strong, robust people with their language, uh, but they were somewhat assimilated with white society. Uh, but still, we had a, a strong cultural identity, language, and uh, uh, we, we lived also amongst many of the tribes that followed that same path, like the Shawnee, the Miami, the Wyandot, the Ottawa. Many of those tribes followed along this same path and signed treaties at about the same time. Finally, after the Civil War, in a treaty in the year 1866, that my tribe, the Delaware tribe, agreed to to sell those lands in Kansas and relocate into the Indian Territory in 1867. Now, we ended up buying land and living amongst the Cherokee Nation who were already there since the 1830s. And we have been in what's now the Cherokee Nation Indian Reservation that became a part of the state of Oklahoma in the year 1907, when we came down from Kansas and established ourselves in the Cherokee Nation Indian Territory, um, again, we were we did it by treaty. So we had both a legal and political and a cultural and ethnic identity combined. And we were, uh, even though we were a small uh, remainder of the original greatness that we were, we were still alive because of our language, our culture, and our ceremonies, and we fought strong to keep that identity. Now, I want to also get, tell just a, real quickly about another band of Delaware that split off from us when we crossed the Mississippi River into the state of Missouri. Um, they, a smaller band of people, split off and you'll see this arrow where they go all the way down into Texas and old Mexico and ultimately 
came back up around through Texas, crossing the Brazos rivers. And in 1872, they uh, found a piece of land and uh, settled amongst the Wichita and the Caddo Indians. And today are established in the town of Anadarko, Oklahoma, as the Delaware Nation. Uh, they're probably about 2,500 people or so, in a, uh, uh, principally based in Western Oklahoma. The Delaware tribe, my band of Delaware, we, we, our numbers uh, approximate some 10,000 uh, men, women, and children. However, we're spread out all over the United States. I'd say about 2,500 or so still live in the Northeastern Oklahoma area. Uh, we are a vibrant community. Uh, we have a tribal government. We are recognized by the federal uh, government uh, and we have a, a tribal government. We have community services. Uh, our tribal campus is about 80 acres of land in a, a town called Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And we're still an active part of this community. We have um, uh, tribal gatherings, uh, both cultural uh, and community. Uh, we work hard to maintain our language um, and also our customs and traditions. It's nothing like it, it used to be, but as long as each succeeding generation uh, desires to hold on to that cultural identity, and the cultural identity is the foundation of who we are, not just a piece of paper or a card issued by the federal government. We are who we are, Lenape people, based on language and culture and customs and traditions and an enduring spirit of honoring the ancestors that passed our identity onto us, our language onto us, and our sense of pride of who we are, because they are the ones that suffered so much along that trail of what I call the trail of broken treaties, the diaspora. We are still alive based on their sacrifices, and we honor them by being who we are today. Now, it's just a very brief and very, very quick walkthrough of our diaspora, uh, but we are one of several communities of people who are recognized by our respective federal governments. Now, um, with that in mind, I am now going to uh, turn to my colleagues on this conversation. And um, uh, with the greatest of respect, I turn first to my uh, very good friend, uh, we've been friends for 25 years. Uh, he is currently the uh, chief of the Muncie, Delaware Nation, um, and Mr. Mark Peters, uh, who is a tremendous historian uh, with great knowledge, gives lectures all the time about uh, Lenape history. And I will turn this now over to Chief Mark Peters. Oh, uh, thank you, Curtis. And... Uh... Loma, everybody. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Mark Peters. I am the elected chief here at the uh, Muncie, Delaware Nation a, on the Thames River, the Dushkan Zebi, uh, in uh, southwestern Ontario, Canada. We also call ourselves uh, Nalahi, up the river from Nahi, or uh, Alonapawe Lakawit, uh, where my friend Brent Stonefish is from. And uh, we uh, are a, what's called a reserve here in Canada. It's the same thing as a reservation in the United States. We have uh, 2,600 acres of land at the present time, and it's a far cry from the amount of land we were promised by the British government for our alliance with them in the American Revolution that Curtis also talked about earlier and how we were on somewhat different sides in a way, I guess. But uh, we are here now and uh, we actually came here right at the end of the American Revolution around 1783. And uh, we came here as three separate groups actually uh, of uh, Muncie's. Uh, we came, uh, uh, through this diaspora that we're talking about, this movement, our, our 
places before we came here to Muncie were Cattaraugus in New York, Sandusky in Ohio, and the Maumee or Miami River in Toledo, Ohio. And we came from three lo those three locations to here around the end of the American Revolution. And we've been here ever since. And we came here based on the promise of a treaty and land in exchange for, as I mentioned, our alliance with the British government. And they haven't lived up to that promise, although we continue to be allies in wars after that, such as the War of 1812 and the Fenian raids and such. So we've had to struggle a bit to maintain our, ourselves without any uh, kind of support. Uh, or annuities or land base, I guess you could say, to really live off of. And we've had to struggle through the uh, century and a half of uh, uh, residential schools and forced assimilation attempts uh, to take away our cultures and identities. And it's only been in the past, past 30, maybe 40, 50 years that we've obtained some sort of sense of uh, independence, the ability to control our own communities, our finances and social and other programs. And now we are at that point where we have the same programs and services as any other community might have, policing, health, education, daycare, employment and training, all these things, education, uh, programming and such. So. Now, things are getting much better here over the past few years, and uh, I've been working on our history for quite some time. In addition to being chief, I've been our historian for quite quite some time, and I've been tracing our movement from the east to our our uh, our occupation here on the Thames River, and I kind of like to start. I, I've been like I, uh, we are, we're called the Muncie Delaware Nation, and we're specifically uh, composed of what are known as Muncies, people from the northern part of Lenape Hoking. Uh, you know, and uh, I've been trying to stick as much to the our particular history as possible because there really isn't much out there about us, and I've been wanting to. To just stick to our particular Muncie history uh, and at the cost of not being able to uh, share other people's history as I go along, I guess you could say. But uh, I, I start off this history actually with a Unami Delaware legend that I read about by a guy named John C. Adams who wrote an a interesting book on Delaware legends and pictographs. And he Got these stories from elderly Delaware people in Oklahoma, I understand. And it's called the legend of the Yaquawi. And it's about this legend that this animal, the Yaquawi, was given to the people for our benefit. However, the Yaquawi got unruly, and there's a big battle between the Yaquawi and the animals and the people. And the Yaquawi got stuck in the bogs and and the blood from the the animals turned the bogs red, and that's why cranberries are red to remind everybody of this great battle. And the Yaquawi is actually the mastodon, or the mammoth in this case. And you know, the mammoth went extinct some eight or ten thousand years ago. And and I just like to start the history with that to show quite likely how long we've been in this area of Lenape Hoking, actually, because there's archeological evidence of continuous occupation and development of tools and weapons and such. And even our people have been known as the grandfather nation of the Algonquian nations in the sense that the Algonquian people's languages themselves sprang from our original uh, languages and occupation of Lenape Hoking. That's my understanding from what I've been able to read. So we've been there a long time. And as we know, the area reaches all the way over from the Delaware River to the Hudson and Long Island. And there's 
many different villages in these areas, especially along the Hudson and in Manhattan, you know, dozens, if not 60 or 70, from what I can calculate as a rough guesstimate at least. And they all had different names for each of their villages. And uh, this is all up and down the Hudson River. And as the Dutch came in and then the English, it took hundreds and hundreds of land transactions to, to, to lose this land over a rather long period of time, a hundred years or more. And then as those people were forced uh, west towards the Delaware River into the what's known as the Minisink area, uh, they started to become known as Muncie's actually around that time is my understanding. And, and that comes from the word Minisink itself, uh, which is also pronounced Mincy or, or Muncie or Monsey, but that's my belief. Uh, well, that's, that's apparently where, where the, the word originally comes from anyway, is this Minisink area after everybody started to move over to that. And after that, significant land fraud started to occur and just blatant outright land thefts, really. And we tried to resist these, uh, these unfair practices by taking people to court and even trying to start wars to prevent our lands from being taken. But our, our, our numbers by then had been decreased significantly by disease, significantly by disease and, and other massacres and wars that occurred during the 1600s. And so we found ourselves uh, really unable to really resist in any physical way, at least. And uh, we, you know, through all these frauds, the walking purchase being a prime example of one of those frauds, we lost our lands, even though we continued to fight for it into the 1760s. Uh, but we, we lost it and can, had to move into the Susquehanna Valley area. And I've been trying to trace, uh, like I say, we came here as three different villages and around 1783 at the end of the American Revolution. I've been trying to trace our people from here to back there. And I've come across the uh, a mention by a man named John Heckewelder. He's a Marine missionary. And uh, we had an incredible relationship with the Moravian people and mercenaries over the 1700s. And they made a lot of very interesting observations and, and they listened to what we had to say and wrote these things down and kept a very good record of, of the kind of people we were and then and even still are. And also various other kinds of information. And one thing that this man, John Von Heckwilder did when he came through Muncie here, where I'm at right now in 1798, was he asked people where we were from at that particular time he came through here. And our people said we were from places called Shemong, which is a place in uh, New York, and a place called Asinisink, which is another place in New York. And these are known as Muncie, specifically Muncie, Minisink type of uh, towns. And one of our chiefs, uh, an elder chief, who he was known as an elder chief in 1835, Moses Logan, uh, in 1830, a surveyor came through here and did a pretty good census of all our names and and where we were born and all this other information. And uh, Moses Logan identified his birthplace as, as Minisink. And when I take a look at the, the dates, if he's an older chief in 1835, he was probably born in 1760 or 1750. And so we can trace him back to through these towns of Shemunk and Asinisink to towns around the Lehigh Valley, I believe, where uh, sachems such as uh, Tedeskong and Manakahikin and Nudimus uh, lived at that time, including a number of Unami Delawares as well, from what I've been finding out. So I don't know how I've <laughs> gone here. How much time I have left? Can, uh... Uh, 
Mark, may I may I ask a a, a question as uh, sure. with the, with the remaining time that we have? Uh, will you tell our viewers about your community today? How what how you went from that colonial era and and being pushed up into Canada, and then how you evolved into your modern community and that which is now known as the Muncie Delaware Nation in Southern Ontario. Yeah, we, uh, you know, when we were forced out of the uh, Delaware River area into the Susquehanna, we kind of lost our independence in a sense by being under the supervision of the Six Nations who've laid claim to the Susquehanna Valley. So we were eventually had to move, you know, back to Ohio to, to get out from under this yoke as well. And uh, that was into what I call the arms of the Western Confederacy, uh, the Anishinaabeg and other different Anishinaabeg speaking peoples, uh, Algonquin speaking peoples. The Miamis were one of our close uh, uh, people that we had a relationship with. So we, uh, like I say, sided with the British during the American Revolution, along with a number of other Anishinaabeg nations, and were invited by them to come up and reside on the Thames River, where we're at now. And we actually live right beside uh, another community called the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. And we also have the Oneida Nation and Iroquois Nation just on the other side of the river from us. We're all geographically connected, excuse me, but uh, so we came here on that uh, relationship and also on the basis of this treaty that we were promised by the British government and land that was supposed to be part of that. We uh, have been fighting that land claim since 1820, actually, and it's still in the process, believe it or not. We should be taking it to court pretty darn soon, but because we weren't part of any treaty or, or land claim, we kind of had to struggle for ourselves significantly, actually. We had to farm and even increase our land base beyond what it traditionally was. It was something like a 1,500 acres. Now we're 2,600 acres. So we did extensive farming throughout the 1800s and even uh, entered into uh, local fairs and such and won a lot of prizes and the discrimination we faced back then is a, can be a sort of uh, an example of that is our treatment at these fairs because we were so good and won all these competitions, they actually decided to make an Indian category so that we could only compete against ourselves. You know, all these are the types of things we faced in addition to the residential school system that was in place at the time. These laws and policies that were meant to take our languages, our culture, our identities away. Now, these went on for, for quite a while. So we, we struggled. Uh, you know, we came here as allies to the British government, long-term allies and friends with the British government, the British crown. And after we weren't needed as allies in, in war anymore, the colonial governments decided to sort of betray that that honor, that alliance that we had with the British crown and decide that we're a problem now and we need to be dealt with in a way of getting rid of us, really. And they've tried, as well as in America, to do that significantly. So, you know, it's an example of the type of people we all are, I think, that we've persevered through all these things and they weren't successful at what they tried to do. Uh, nowhere near that, and we're recovering our languages, our histories, our cultures. There's, it's out there to, 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 to get back or to learn from people who've kept on to these things. So I guess that's where we're kind of at now. We have a population of about 200 people on the reserve here, 600 members in total, not very a large nation at all. We're called a small first nation in Canada. But we uh, are quite progressive, I think. We are getting an internet system put up in the next couple of weeks so everybody gets a signal and can get online and, and share in these types of events, actually. And, you know, just uh, 
get into the modern world to a certain degree, but also hang on to our and, and learn our traditions and history. Thank you very much, Chief. And uh, uh, again, we have been friends for very many years. Uh, we've both been in politics and in history and culture. You're definitely one of the mo foremost uh, historians among the Muncie, Delaware nation. And we're grateful that you have uh, joined us and shared uh, uh, the story of your community. And I'm now going to send it just down the road to another longtime friend of mine who is uh, uh, an incredible scholar. Uh, uh, you know, he, he grew up as an Indian boy on the, on the reserve uh, and knows all about culture and language, but he has become an incredible scholar uh, and is a, uh, is a teacher and a leader amongst his people down the road at Moravian Town, Delaware, First Nation. And at this time, I would like to recognize uh, my friend and Lenape brother, Brent Stonefish. And Brent, if you'll introduce yourself and along the same lines, uh, tell the story of your people's movement and who the uh, Muncie, Delaware, I'm sorry, who the Moravian Town, Delaware First Nation is today. Well, Kwinganao Lomwa, Nidi Shinzi Akok Paposi, Dami Minzi Tekoch, Nino Jari Al Napawi Lakawi, Niha Del Napawi. Uh, my name is Brent Stonefish. Uh, I am from El Napawi La Kawit, which uh, roughly translates to Delaware Nation. Uh, it's a name that uh, we took on uh, a few years ago, just recently within the past uh, four years, that has officially become our name for our community. Um, it's a translation of Delaware Nation. And uh, so we use that as... as uh, when we when we introduce ourselves and our people are still trying to get used to it because we're known under many different names uh, to the federal government to the Canadian federal government originally we were called Raven of the Thames Indian Band and then we became uh, Raven of the Thames Delaware Nation and uh, and then people referred to us as uh, Delaware First Nation and uh, Affectionately, uh, community members and neighboring communities uh, refer to us as Bucktown. And uh, Bucktown uh, meaning where all the bucks live. If you want to get yourself a buck, you come to Bucktown. So, uh, and uh, and funny thing is, is that uh, my wife, who, uh, uh, who grew up in Toronto, uh, she's uh, Anishinaabe, uh, from Henvey Inlet First Nation, which is along the northern shore of uh, of uh, Lake Huron, she she knew of my community as Bucktown before she even met me. And uh, two kids later, uh, we live in the community. So uh, I've been uh, I've been home in the community, uh, living in on the old uh, family homestead for the last couple of years uh, after my father who uh, who died. Um, we moved into his house, but, uh, before that I was living in, uh, uh, Ridgetown for about five years, which is a neighboring, uh, non-native community. And I've been pretty active within the community as far as, uh, I was, uh, did a term as elected counselor. And I was also the director of our education department for about three years. Uh, one of the things that uh, about my community is is that I've always had a a passion for knowing who we are and where we come from. Um, one of my biggest teachers in uh, the history of our community was uh, my uncle, uh, my biological uncle Daryl Stonefish, who was uh, the historian for the community for over about thirty years. And I remember in grade nine. Uh, being his assistant, being hired as a summer student and being his assistant and him making me go through uh, some of the old uh, missionary diaries of uh, Hector and of uh, 
Zeisberg, uh, Moravian Mission, which is uh, this community was uh, named after a Moravian town. Um, we settled in this this area uh, after forced removal from our homelands uh, in 1792. We uh, we recognized May 8th, uh, 1792, as the day we established Fairfield, which was the original name of our community on the north side of the Thames River um, in uh, 1792. And from that point, we uh, moved to the southern side of the river after the War of 1812, where everybody uh, recognizes Tecumseh, where Tecumseh fell in the Battle of the Thames, um, but uh, in, was a, a successful in ensuring that this part of uh, Canada remained in British, uh, British control over the Americans. But uh, we, uh, when growing up, one of the things that uh, we had always wanted to understand is where we came from. And first thing that I thought we were always here, that our ancestors were always in Moravian Town, because our people have such a great pride in, in where we live. And then as I got older, we started to hear stories about when we lived in Ohio. And the most significant date in that history is uh, around uh, 1781, March 8th, 1781, when uh, 90 uh, women, children, and men were, were uh, massacred by the, by the American army and militia who uh, were all Christian Indians at the time and were from three different settlements, uh, Moravian mission settlements in the area in Ohio, around Sandusky, Ohio. And uh, we, uh, uh, Dover, Ohio as well, uh, around that area where we were settled with the Moravian mission. And for the longest time after that, I recognized, well, maybe that was our homeland before, and after that massacre, our ancestors ended up coming here. While uh, doing more research and, and being a part of uh, the Moravian Town Historical Society in the early 90s and working with uh, different people like our, our uh, former chief, now deceased Richard Snake, and working with Jim Tobias, who was one of my first traditional teachers, and and working with Daryl as well, and and different uh, historians, Teresa Johnson, and different people in the community that have little bits and pieces of our history. Um, we found out that we were displaced from Pennsylvania uh, during the 1700s, and and that that we were, and that even we were displaced even further from around uh, the Hudson River Valley, around where you would, where my my uncle has traced us even going back to the West, Westchester County area, uh, Yonkers and all that area of, of Manhattan Island and so on and so forth. And then when the purchase happened of Manhattan, we got pushed across the river into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, along with our with our relatives that were already in that area. And the one way that our relatives sought to survive was we joined the Moravian Mission. We joined the Moravian Missions in Pennsylvania, and we were scattered around Pennsylvania and Bethlehem and different areas like that, Brotherton and different areas like that, until, until Pennsylvania declared war on us. And that's when the Moravian missions took us and went with us and pushed and moved us into Ohio, which was promised to be an Indian territory, which then Lenape would be ahead of. And again, war came, war pushed us again, and we ended up coming up south of Lake Erie and settling for a little time in Amherstburg and Mount Clemens in Michigan and Amherstburg, Ontario, and then eventually making our way 
to where we are now. And then we had different relatives that came through Ohio via Six Nations and Muncie and settled in Moravian Town as well. So we're all connected. We're all connected somewhere along the line. It was just a matter of how we chose to survive, how we chose to ensure that we still live today. And so that's one of the biggest things that, that I've researched. And, and one of the things that I've noticed in my research and, and doing that type of, of timeline is that with every major war or skirmish between the colonizers, be it the Americans, the British, the French, the Dutch, we were, scat we were displaced even further. So they were fighting over our territories and in the process fighting each other for our territories in the process moving us and pushing us away. And, and so the other part of my research that I've, I've spent a lot of time is talking to different elders and getting an oral history, getting an oral history of, of our migration and getting an oral history of what our nation looked like pre-contact because there's not a lot talked about pre-contact how did we see ourselves in territories because we didn't see ourselves as with john lockwood in private privatizing land we didn't see ourselves in that type of relationship with the land and with each other in our territories be it us the unami the the Muncie or the Unilactico or or any of our the Delaware Delaware offsprings or spring offs or whatever colonial term you want to use for us, we didn't see ourselves that way. We seen ourselves as in clans and we seen ourselves having certain responsibilities based in the territories that we lived because of the resources that we could share in commerce and how we came together to divide that and to share that and to trade that and to, to make sure the bloodlines were pure and to make sure the bloodlines were clean. And, and so, so that's, that's, you know, I know we don't have a lot of time to go into that part of it, but that's, that's where, that's where my research right now is looking at is, is, the elders that I've that I have had the fortune to talking to, not just Lenape elders, but Nishnabe and Haudenosaunee, and different elders and different knowledge bearers that know stuff about our history and our shared history of, of diaspora as we made our way from the East Coast. And Brent, uh, would you also briefly share with us the? contemporary or current profile of of a bucktown of your community like approximately how many people the size of the reserve and what kinds of services uh, are provided to your community members well just like uh, mark had said we are considered a reserve in in, in canada and when we first became a reserve in our in canada our reserve was uh, 12 by 16 miles uh, in, in, in uh, size. Today, we live occupied by two Breaking out. Um, I regret we're having some technical difficulties with uh, Brent's broadcast. So, in the interest of, we also uh, have here we band go. membership, band enrollment. Oh, please continue. Are we back on? Yes. Where did, where did you? Um, 
I, again, I, I regret we're having some technical difficulties with Brent's location and his uh, online connection. If you could, if you could just, if Brent, if, if you're on, if you could just, uh, again, finish up the outline of uh, the profile of your community for our viewers. Okay. Um, 12 people that are enrolled. Mm. I'm, I'm so, I'm so sorry. We're going to, we're going to blame it on, uh, we're going to blame it on the internet. Um, so at this time, uh, in the interest of continuing on for our panel discussion, I'm now going to turn to, uh, a young woman who has been very patient on our call. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, when we talked so much about the Muncie people, uh, there is a, uh, a, a band of Muncie's that allied with the Stockbridge people, and I'm going to let her tell their story as part of the Lenape and Muncie diaspora. However, I do want to introduce Heather Briegel, who is uh, a, a descendant of the Stockbridge Muncie people. She's also enrolled at Oneida Nation in Wisconsin, and she is currently the Director of Cultural Affairs for the Stockbridge Muncie community and uh, she oversees their library, museum, historic preservation, and language revitalization <laughs> within the community. And um, they are located uh, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, she is also a historian by training with both a bachelor's and a master's degree uh, in history. And uh, she lectures and has a, a great knowledge about uh, Native American policy and activism. And it is my pleasure to introduce Heather Briegel. Thank you so much. Um, I feel honored just being part of this panel. I feel like even though I'm supposed to be here talking about the Stockbridge Munsey, I've learned so much from the speakers who have come before me that I'm like, I don't need to say, say anything. But um, so I'm just, I'm honored to be part of this group. Um, as Curtis said, my name is Heather Briegel. I'm enrolled citizen, Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, first line descendant, Stockbridge Muncie, and I have the privilege of working as our cultural affairs director here. I'm coming to you from our reservation uh, on 1856 treaty land um, when we were moved here. And I'm going to tell you just uh, Heather, for just, if I may, let's get our other uh, Mark and Brent, if you would. Can you mute your mics? Because I'm getting a little bit of feedback. If you could mute your mic, that allows uh, Heather. So please proceed. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Good. Um, so I am. I feel like so much was already said that I just you know I'm gonna bring up the the end really uh, quickly. But um, so Stockbridge Muncie, our origins start in the Mahikanatuck River Valley, which is known as the Hudson River Valley with um, our Mohican roots. And so Stockbridge is very much a colonized name that we got when we were in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which is part of our Mohican ancestral land. Super important in our history, um, but we originated, you know, in along the, the Mahikanatuck River Valley. And when, you know, we were there, we, you know, we met Henry Hudson, we, you know, uh, found him off of our shores and we're like, what are you doing? And so um, we pretty much uh, helped um, our people. Uh, one of our council fires was in Albany. And um, so we had a couple of movements along our trail. And one of our movements was in, like I said, in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And when um, we were there, we, grew, we uh, met up with a group of Muncie people who uh, were displaced by everyone else. And we kind of all joined together and there was a mission there and we kind of all became Christianized. So as we've learned earlier, 
um, from the map that was shown and from the amazing speakers we've had previous to me, the Muncie went in different directions. And so there were some Muncie that came to Stockbridge, Massachusetts and joined us there. And from there, we, um, you know, we fought in the revolution. There was a great, oh, there's the map that's good to show. Um, so if you go, our, so the Mahikanatuck territory, Mohican territory, if you look at Stockbridge, Massachusetts on the map, and then you go up and you follow the Hudson River, that's where our territory was. But Stockbridge is kind of where we met up with other groups, including the Oneida, the Wappinger, the Narragansetts, um, and group of Muncie that came that way as well. From there, um, after we helped the colonists win the American Revolution, um, from there, we were then displaced um, to New York, to uh, different parts of New York. From there, we were then moved to Indiana, White River, Indiana. And then from there, we were... Um, some people went to Ohio there. Then we went up through Illinois and then we, that's how we ended up on our current reservation where we are today, which is on uh, through the 1856 treaty. We had a couple stops in Wisconsin before we get, went there. We had settlements down near Lake Winnebago, which is in the Southern part of the state. But then um, 1856 uh, kind of is, uh, was our stopping point, And that's where we've been ever since. We encompass two townships, which is the townships of Red Springs and Bartlemy. Uh, currently, our uh, reservation land is 23, just over 23,000 acres. Um, and that is through, some of that is trust land and some of that is fee land. Um, we live in a very forested area and uh, lumber and forestry was was huge in this area. And so through lumber barons coming in, we were we did lose some of that land. So some of the land that we have been able to buy back has been, it's fee land currently in the process of becoming trust land. But interesting to point out, because I do know that Curtis did mention this earlier, when he was talking about his nation is while we were here, there was a split in some of our, um, our people. So we had some that split because there were rumors that we were going to be moved again. And so some kind of jumped the gun and moved down to Kansas near the Fort Leavenworth area. And then some stayed there and some came back. So it, it, it was kind of, um, we were kind of scattered all over the place. But what makes us unique is not only do, are we Mohican and we have that Mohican language that we're currently trying to revitalize. We also have the Muncie language and I have the privilege of being able to work with um, a lot of elders in the community, um, one by the name of Molly Miller, who uh, is heading our language revitalization right now and um, is is very um, knowledgeable in Muncie. And so a lot, we do have not, I wouldn't say fluent speakers, but we do have a lot of speakers in the community who can speak Muncie and we are getting those um, in the community that can speak Mohican as well. I actually just um, had the privilege of uh, having my naming ceremony this past weekend and it was done in Muncie and it was absolutely beautiful. So we embrace our Mohican roots, but we also embrace those Muncie ancestors um, who are still with us today. And we are just unique because we are, we are Mohican, but we are also Muncie. So we carry that through our through our blood as well. And we have, um, it's a small nation here. Uh, it's about 1,500 in enrollments, um, but we are thriving. We have our own tribal government, um, uh, education department. We have our cultural affairs department, which is constantly growing. Um, we have our own legal department. We have roads. We have, you know, public works. So we are uh, definitely a nation um, within itself. And it's it's very exciting. And I want to thank um, Curtis and I want to thank um, Indigenous Peoples Day Philly for uh, including me in this panel. And I'm very proud to represent the Stockbridge Muncie people. Thank you, Heather. And it's a, it's a great uh, pleasure and a privilege for you to be part of this group. Um, and uh, I must say, I've had the uh, I've had the honor and privilege of visiting each of your communities uh, over the years. And I think it's very important that not just this type of uh, uh, scholarly and his history types of presentations on 
uh, modern conveniences on the internet, but that we do take time to visit each other as relatives uh, and based around culture um, uh, more often than we do uh, coming together as a bunch of politicians or government people. And uh, I think that's the, the, the strength that we have uh, is our ancestral connections. Now, uh, Brent Stonefish is back um, with a little bit better connection. And Brent, if you would, uh, in the remaining time we have, if you could just give us a brief community profile, again, of, uh, of your uh, reserve, uh, your physical location, uh, a little bit of, about your tribal government, and what services you offer to your people. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, when I, I think I left off is, is that we are in a community uh, roughly two by two miles. Uh, we're located in uh, southern, southwestern Ontario, about uh, 60 miles uh, east of uh, Detroit, if that gives you any context, uh, within the Canadian borders. Um, as far as what we have here, we have an elected council. Uh, we have uh, an elected chief and five councillors, and uh, we, we get uh, some funding from the federal government, uh, and we have your usual stuff. We have uh, health services, we have social services, we have uh, infrastructure, we have a roads department. We have all the things that uh, help a community uh, thrive or uh, survive in some senses. Uh, because there's never enough funding from the government. Um, one of the other things, though, that uh, we are priding ourselves in is is that uh, we have uh, one of the very last uh, speakers of the the Muncie dialect of Lenape that live in the community, and she's a uh, she's in her late seventies, and right now uh, she has uh, five apprentices that she's been teaching for the last five years in uh, the language and uh, right now i believe they're in the process of uh, of uh, getting a plan together to help uh, revitalize the language even more so and to create more resources uh, there's a the ladies and uh, that have been learning a language uh, are working in many different capacities within the community and and i just can't uh, you know sing their praises enough just because of the amount of time and effort they've put into learning the language that uh, they should all be PhD candidates as far as I'm concerned for the amount of, uh, of work and effort that, that they've put into helping to revitalize the language. Um, as far as uh, culture goes, uh, there are different, uh, different people in the community that have spent a lot of time uh, researching culture and uh, going to ceremonies and learning different things. And, and we try to get together uh, as much as possible, try to have different uh, community events. One of the events that we have, myself, I'm the coach, one of the co-chairs of the Lenape Heritage Circle. And uh, we try to have Lenape Heritage Days every October that coincide with the time that we would have our big house ceremony. Um, this year, of course, we haven't been able to have it because of COVID-19 restrictions, and hopefully we get that up and running again next year. But uh, there's a big effort uh, amongst our people to revitalize culture and revitalize language and uh, try to become a sovereign nation again. Uh, I think that there's great effort to be uh, self-sufficient and self uh governing without uh, Western influences, but uh, that's uh, something that we've been working towards and also working towards, you know, getting together with our brothers and sisters within the, the, within the other Lenape uh, territories and communities across Turtle Island. I think that's one of the biggest things that uh, we've been focusing on as well. So there's lots going on there as far as infrastructure and, and, you know, we're just, uh, trying to be a community and uh, lead our way towards uh, a healthy community. All right. Thank you, Brent Stonefish. And um, <clears throat> at this time, I, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out if I could say something that 
is uh, really profound uh, as a way of, of a concluding remark. And my observation is, is based on us getting together and talking about our communities, our, our westward forced migration, that we have survived and we have thrived. And we have done so because we have been inspired by the, uh, our ancestors. They went through a lot more than we could ever imagine to hold on to their lives, their identity, their culture. Those ancestors did it because they turned to the creator and prayed in our Lenape language and asked for help to survive. We are survivors. Even though we split up into various groups, we still come together and symbolically return as the great Lenape nation, the great Delaware nation of people that have had such a profound impact in the history of North America. And we do so because we honor those ancestors and their sacrifices. And in doing so, it provides goodness for our people. We have survived pandemic. We have survived um, uh, diaspora. We have survived uh, efforts to totally kill us off. We have survived this. Today, we will survive coronavirus and COVID-19. And the, that which inspires us the most is when we look at our children and our grandchildren. And like many cultures, we are just a series and a continuing series of generations of people. And we honor our, our obligation and we try to fulfill that by bringing our children along and giving them cultural identity and making them recognize the trail of broken treaties, the, the, the trail of, 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 uh, of our ancestors that have brought us to where we are today. And even though we're not the same as we were 200, 300, 400, 500 years ago, we have the enduring Lenape spirit inside us. And as the leaders that you see on the screen today representing our communities, we seek to pass that on to the younger generation and inspire them to do the same. And that's how that Lenape spirit will endure. And I now turn back to uh, uh, the um, indigenous People's Day Philly, uh, our, our host organization. And there will be future um, uh, discussions like this, panel discussions that will be broadcast on the internet. Um, and I uh, uh, encourage uh, and wish the best to Indigenous People's Day Philly as they recognize the roots of their community there in the Philadelphia area and the very, uh, not just uh, Lenape descendants, but so many other native people who have come to that area and uh, are part of a very uh, 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 amazing cross-section of people in this great city of Philadelphia. But we will never forget that the Lenape people were there first before the colonizers, before the Europeans, before William Penn ever showed up. And that enduring spirit will keep our presence there uh, forever. I wanna thank again, Indigenous Peoples Day Philly for inviting us to be a part of this conversation. And again, my thanks to Chief Mark Peters from Muncie, Delaware Nation, uh, Brent Stonefish from Delaware First Nation, uh, Moravia Town, Ontario, Heather uh, Briegel, Director of Cultural Affairs for the Stockbridge Muncie community, and myself, Curtis Zuniga, representing the Delaware Tribe of Indians in Oklahoma. With that, I will Lepich Kanewil. I will see you again. And uh thank you all. <laughs>